Hi everyone, this is Dan. Myself and Matt joined our friend Kevin Olenek from the Shifts and Pucks podcast on Friday evening. As we talked about Johnny Goudreau, tried to process what had happened, and really just came together as podcasters to help us grieve and help us remember. We're hoping that this show helps you do the same, and we would obviously love to hear your thoughts about Johnny and Matthew. If you have anything that you remember, if you have anything you want to share or talk about, please reach out to us. Leave a comment on our website at firesidechat.ca or any of our social media. We think one of the best ways that we can all heal together is to talk about it and share those memories together. We won't play our usual show intro. You'll hear a moment of silence coming up, and after that will be the show from Friday night. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to... It's even weird to say welcome at this point. I don't even know what, what there is an appropriate way to introduce this, but we're doing a joint podcast today for not a fun reason. Uh, it's a Shifts and Pucks and the Fireside Chat have joined together uh, for a uh, podcast that I, I think is going to be a little tough to get through. Um, uh, started about 24, well, almost 24 hours ago, we started to hear rumors on social media about um, a past, the passing of Johnny Goodrow. And uh, we learned this morning that Johnny and his brother Matthew were killed in a very tragic uh, collision involving a uh, involving a, a car and a mo- and two uh, and bicycles. Which Johnny let's be honest, had. Kevin, it's not just a car accident. It was a drunk driver who was actually yeah. drinking at yeah, the time me, he was yeah, driving. Yeah, it's, I, I was going to. I, I, I use the word collision. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, as Dan said, this is a very tragic event uh, involving a drunk driver. Um, there was a charge, a couple of charges to uh, to Sean Higgins, 43 years old, uh, two counts of death by auto. And he, yeah, it's, it's a, just been a very devastating day. I just, I'll just start where, where I was. I learned to, I got a, I was half, my eyes were half open at 5.30 in the morning. I'm in Vancouver and I saw the news outlet break that, that it was Johnny and Matthew passed away. And I was like, I'm going to go back to sleep now. And I actually, I couldn't go back to sleep. It's been one of those days that I've certainly been in a fog for, um, I think most of the hockey community has been in the fog for, and yeah, so uh, we're we're here to pay tribute to not only Johnny, but we'll we'll get into Matthew. But I want to give just some space for Dan and Dan from Matt from Fireside Chat to kind of tell us where you're at at this point. Um, how are I? I don't want to ask how you're feeling. I kind of probably know how you're feeling, but I'm just going to give the, the floor to you. Now, why don't you start? Well, um, last night I was uh, one of the people that kind of found the rumors around uh, midnight our time uh, in Calgary. and I hope there's just some bored folks who are waiting for hockey season to start. Um, and uh, was surfing Reddit, and I'm like, oh, that sounds like kind of a hoaxy kind of thing. And... Mm-hmm. Then uh, I was up for an extra hour or so, and um, like considering it happened several hours prior, I'm like, normally there would have been somebody saying something that like it's a hoax and it would have died out if it wasn't true. And then woke up this morning around uh, seven thirty and uh, found out that yes, in fact, it happened and. Just a absolutely terrible day uh, as a Flames fan, as a fan of Gaudreau, as you know, somebody who likes their family, uh, likes you know the teammates that were impacted by Gaudreau and his family. Like it, it just it, it's lousy all the way around. Like it, it's a senseless thing to have happened. All the surrounding events of it are just terrible. Like it, you could not have written a more horrible story, and yeah, it, it's just there's nowhere to put it. Like it, it, 
like how would you say like with like Chris Snow passing away last year like it, at least with him like it was a long drawn out thing with his battle with ALS so you kind of knew that the end was coming even though you know you you helped for him to battle but you know like everybody's looking forward to the season coming up in a we couple knew weeks. there was snowy the time would come we didn't know when yeah but you know we know the season's coming up in a couple of weeks everybody's getting ready like good and monahan we're getting ready for camp looking forward to being blue jackets together and now he's gone and like there's nowhere to put it like it, it's just lousy 31 years old i mean you know younger than everyone on this podcast right he's making great money he, you know as much as as much as i wasn't happy at the time with how he left the team and you know all that you got to give the guy credit i mean we're all looking for better work life balance and that's exactly why he went where he went right he did what he had to do for his family he was the ultimate family man he, that family loved each other so much Guy Goudreau was probably a bigger fa face here in Calgary than any other parent I can think of besides, you know, Matthew Kachuk's father. Like, everybody knew Goudreau's dad. Everybody knew who he was. He was a, he was a figure here. And Johnny, I mean, take, you know, I would say between Johnny and Jerome, it's a tough say who the better Flame was. They're both dynamic in their own way. This is a, a huge loss for Flames fans, for NHL fans, for Blue Jackets fans. I mean... You know, Matt and I have talked a lot about what would constitute an emergency summer podcast. This was not even on my list. Like, you know, yeah. I, I don't know. I still don't really know what to say about this. I've been trying to process emotions all day. I had some interaction with Johnny when I had media credentials with the Flames. He always treated me great. Um, limited interaction, I'll say. But, you know, I mean, this is just, I don't know. Th this is... I feel the worst for the family. And Johnny was the ultimate family man, right? This happened the day before his sister's wedding. He and his brother were supposed to be up there. He's leaving behind a wife and two kids. His brother's leaving behind a wife and, you know, a newborn. Like, these families are torn apart now. And I think this gentleman is the ultimate reminder. These people are not just hockey playing robots. These are human beings. And we have to remember that. And you know like as much as like uh, as fans and people covering the flames we were disappointed that Gaudreau and Kachuk moved on after the 22 season um you know like I'm frankly grateful that he at least had the remainder of his life being out east with his family mm -hmm. you know like to me I view that as kind of a blessing that you know nobody expected this but at least for the time that he had remaining he, he was at least closer to home and, could and, and he passed away in his home city like you know he was home with his family yeah um you know i i think to as much as you're saying matt we're all disappointed that he left as commentators as analysts it's always fun to have the heel right and i think we made those two the heels because you know we want that drama. And I think that's a lot. Oh, of it. Yeah. I mean, you know, as much as I was disappointed with how Goudreau left and you know, all that, he's still fun to watch. And I treasure every moment I got to watch him in a flames Jersey. Yeah. I, a couple of other things I think that is important to note here. Um, there is a, uh, go fund me for Matthew and, uh, his wife, um, Marianne, uh, they were expecting a child. Uh, so not only did Johnny's kids lose a father, um, Matthew's kids are going to lose yeah. a father. His wife, Madeline. Madeline is, yeah. So that is a very, that's very horrible situation. And I think this was mentioned and said, of course, they were at their sister Katie's wedding and um so this was a big family get together um as far as kevin on this go fund me good for hockey fans they were trying to raise three they they they've raised almost or sorry thirty thousand, and they've raised almost two hundred thousand. so yeah good job well, hockey community yeah and let you know just um on that note you know i know that you know the hockey community has taken some bruises for some pretty devastating things that have happened the last few years. And I think social media has also taken some bruises within the last few years 
just because of the behavior of many on men on the platforms. But I thought, you know, this is the power of why social media can be an effective tool. And today was a day where you really just saw people just come together and put down their, if it, just for a lack, just for kind of a pardon the pun here, put their, down their sticks, their gloves and, and their skates and just kind of get together and just realize what, what has happened here. It was, um, it was a very devastating day. It was a shocking, I, you know, even with the rumors that were going around, I still felt completely stunned and shocked. And I, it, it really feels like I've never met Johnny. I, I moved from Calgary actually when Johnny started to really come into his own. I mean, I was there for the rookie year 2015. I was there for his first game in Vancouver in 2014, but I wasn't in Calgary from 16 to now. And you know, you're an OG if you saw him wearing number 53. Yeah. <laughs> right. See, uh, but. <laughs> People forget about that. He yeah. wasn't always 13. Yeah. yeah. But it's, um, it, you know, I, it felt like I lost a friend today. Yeah. It felt mm -hmm. like I lost a guy that I got to somehow know in a way that, yeah, it just, it felt like there was a connection. And I think that the difference with Johnny and Jerome and Lanny is I feel like a lot of people looked at Johnny as their child. And I'm not saying that in a um, derogatory way. I think it was his, sort of his stature, the way he just kind of operated. It was sort of this aw shucks kind of boyish good looks charm that had about him. Like both Jerome and Johnny will be known for their smile. I think if both are both electric, but Jerome, it was sort of a, like Jerome would punch you in the face, Johnny. You don't want anyone to punch you, Kevin. I think some of that too comes down to the eras they were both in. And Johnny yeah. was a flame and was 18 during the social media era. And we saw this guy grow up on and off the ice. We saw pictures of him out partying and doing what young men do, right? 18, 19, 20 year old out partying, maybe making some silly decisions. And you know, which one of us hasn't at 18, 19, 20 years old? We didn't have those when Jerome was younger, right? We kind of yeah. saw them in the rink. Or if you were in Calgary, you might have seen them at the back alley or something. So I think fans feel that way because we're more connected to these players than ever. Yeah. I think, again, I think that's a bro in a broader sense, that's true too, because I think we all feel something for Johnny. We all feel something for John. Um, and uh, not only in Calgary, I mean, I think there's still, there are reefs and and memorials and vigils being put up at Bell Center. There, I know there's something going on at Rogers Arena here in Vancouver. Yep. So it is just it impact the guy impacted everybody. Like, and just well, let's be honest, he lit up everybody, right? He impacted well, everybody somehow. Yeah, and you, you look at, like, normally, like, the families of the players, you kind of don't, you, you know, unless it's, like, a Kachuk situation where his dad was a player, you don't know who, you know, any of these people are. Like, when they show the dads on the Jumbotron, mm -hmm. it's like, oh, okay, that's the dads. Generic who's, dad who's, number who, seven, yeah. Yeah, who cares? But, you know, like, we knew his dad, we knew his mom, we knew his brother, we knew his sister, like... Mm -hmm and his wife and you know like they were all very inclusive in the flame his dad was a character right like people yeah, knew yeah. him and he had a person not just by look he became a character yeah and everybody knew you know like they'd throw him up on the jumbotron and like everybody would cheer because oh hey it's gee and you know like that's not normal but uh, that's like a sh sign of like how good of a family man he and his family are yeah. that like they were included and in, inclusive um you got one good you got them all and like even his uh brother played briefly for the stockton heat and you know like it it's just so hard when that something like this happens you know kevin you were talking about how something like this brings the community together and matt was down at the dome today matt captured this picture that has been on our social media and i mean i've seen subsequent pictures of oilers fans going up paying tribute and you know i mean it's kind of in our blood as calgarians if you see a guy wearing you know blue and orange you've got a rasm but you know today it reminds me of when the humble tragedy happened today we were a hockey community we weren't flames fans we weren't oilers fans we weren't leafs fans we weren't you know 
anything but hockey fans. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, just be, I mean, we're going to, I think the most of our conversation is going to be about Johnny, but I do want to spend a couple of moments talking about Matthew and just paying tribute to him. He, he had 10 seasons of hockey, uh, two in the with the Omaha Lancers, four with Boston College. Uh, he played in – basically his career was minor league, but he played with the Bridgeport Sound Tigers, the Worcester Railers, the Reedian Royals, and as well four games with the Stockton Heat. So, no, it's not a professional career. He was undrafted, but he still played minor hockey. And, um, you know uh, – I, it's, it is just devastating. He's 29 years old and just far too young for any. Just, yeah, just, and he was going into the coaching realm as well. Like, yeah, I, he I did do believe he was since 2021, 22 yeah. with the uh, Philadelphia Hockey Club, the Rebels, the uh, Catholic High Schools. So, you know, uh, we see that often, right? These guys that are in, um, you know, the minors and you know get out when they realize they're not going to make a pro and stay in hockey so yeah still you know and, and i mean not huge numbers but to get 40 points in the echl in 38 games that shows that you're you know a decent hockey player and you did that in in 1920 yeah yep. yeah yeah it's uh it, I'm just uh, sad on that that level and yeah, getting into coaching, just be about to become a father for the first time. Uh, all of those important transition points are were lost by just uh, a very senseless act. Um, and, you know, I, I do want to also just take a couple of moments here to talk a little bit through, just from a traffic anchor perspective, sort of what happened at a couple of different levels last night. So we should uh, just give some background. That's what you do professionally. You just don't have a weird thing for traffic anchors. Yeah. So just so for those who don't know, my the way I make money is not by Dan and Matt donating me money. Uh, it is working. <laughs> I work with uh, I'm a traffic anchor with uh, News 1130 out here in Vancouver. Uh, it's mostly evening, sometimes afternoon, sometimes weekend, whatever, whenever it is. It's, you know, I'm just one of those that. But a um, couple of things last night, you know, there was a lot of questions given to a lot of reporters about why they weren't posting everything. First of all, let me let me start here. Um, just from my perspective, this and, I, and you mentioned it earlier that we, we don't use the word accident. That was one of the first things I learned I'm talking about traffic is we don't call it an accident. Uh, we I use either collision or incident, mostly collision. Uh, I I'm not necessarily even comfortable myself using the word crash. Others use it. That's okay. That's there. And I'm not against the word accident. I guess where I've been upset today is just hearing collision with vehicle. This wasn't just a collision with a vehicle. This was a drunk driver. Let's call it what it was. Yeah, I even get that. I and I totally understand where you're coming from. But I've, I've as for me, like during the live aspect of what was going on before we knew everything, it is. It is a collision, and I don't know if that's a drunk driver or not, right? It's a collision. That's mm -hmm. what I'm there to re simply report. The simple fact is, is there was a collision involving a car and a bicycle at that point. John, and I'm just going from last night, not to what we know now. Um, and it is also, and I, we've had a, I, we, we had a situation this summer where it took, there, and there's been a few times when we transitioned from one anchor to another, the collision or the situation that we're talking about hasn't cleared so and we still are not getting the details about what's going on and there's a guy that tweets out information uh, in some cases when it's particularly devastating with named corporal noon if he's if they're tweeting out we know it's a very serious situation and these things take an incredible amount of time to process and get through because you cannot and it just unfortunately this happened last night you cannot just say whatever happened without knowing in, the information and digesting the information and making sure that the people that need to know what has happened i.e in this case the Goudreau and Valeno and the families involved are aware of what's happened they should not have known 
on social media. And I do know, and I do think what happened is um, it sounded like there was one insider. I believe Frank, it sounded like Frank Saravalli was in a chat or, and I'm not saying he was releasing the information, but he was calling the hockey community and letting them know that. And I think a couple of other people got wind of it. And unfortunately, that's how that end got reported. But for those that were asking why this wasn't rushed, that's basically why. You don't know what's happening at the time. It takes, it can take a really long time for things like this to, to clear. And we all of the information needs to be made aware before that information comes out. Like our reporters, we... Uh, we'll send out information to the particular police that are involved and it does, they don't always get back as quickly as people think. And I know that people are like, what happened? What happened? What's the situation? These things take a lot of time. And I think that, that unfortunately there was, there was a little bit of impatience with some people last night, especially, you know, involving, involved the, the, P, the person involved in Johnny and I totally get it, but it still takes time. And you even, if it is Johnny Gaudreau or a celebrity or anyone else, the, it's the first responders' responsibility to make sure all of the information is correct before they send out what happened. That's and what, Kevin, especially, especially in sports, right? We have this thing where insiders want to be the first one to break a story. And I think, again, you know, we talked about how this is the ultimate reminder that these are people. I think sometimes these people are used to working on, I got to break it first. I got to be the first one to break it. And, you know, as hockey fans, when we hear, you know, a trade is being made, we know that announcements are imminent. And I think as the hockey fans in us, we're expecting to keep it and refresh and get that information. And we go digging into it. And we like to do that as hockey fans, right? We like to look at this guy and look at that guy and okay, these rumors are overlapping. And I think we did what we know how to do as hockey fans. And you're right. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that comes out in any situation like this, celebrity or not, where people are on scene, people reporting things aren't true. And this is where I think, you know, I always remind people for anything like this, find your sources, right? The guy who's tweeting, who is on the road or driving by, probably not your source. Wait for Cervelli, wait for Drager, wait for, you know, in this case, An official statement from the NHL, New York times. Whatever. Yeah. The NHL, the team, like, you know, I know it's fun to be on social media and we like to do these things, hockey fans, but in cases like this, we need to give patience. And like Kevin said, the, the family needs to be alerted, right? The family needs to process that. And we, we need to step back there. And remember, this isn't a trade that's breaking. This is the end of somebody's life. And unfortunately, the other part of that is, is uh, one particular individual did who, I mean, Yes, he was right, but he made a very, very unfortunate error. And I think it's something he's probably going to regret for the rest of his life when he posted the rumor. Um, it is a horrible mistake. And, and I get the anger towards him, but I also, in a way, I don't know if the words empathize or sympathize, but I feel for him because... Um, he, it was a very bad, like, I just, I hope that he gets some support in terms of just even learning or whatever he needs to get for the, so whatever support he gets. I like, what I hate about social media is I get that people get mad at things, but I think the pile on part of this is where I just, I can't take part in that. I can't take part in someone getting viscerated because yes, it was a horrendous mistake for sure but like at some point we have to balance this horrendous mistake with realize that that person that made the mistake is also a human being and, and also trying to do their job and break news well i think he was just i think he was trying to get he was trying to be a guy that got first on the scoop and yeah. he, it was just a poorly worded message and i'm not going to repost it or anything i'm not even going to name him but it was just a poorly, poorly worded, poorly handled, handled situation. I, but I, again, why does it happen? Because as fans, we demand breaking news, yeah, right? So yeah. while shame on this person, also maybe shame on us as a community for yeah. you know demanding that immediate news. And we yeah. demand that as credibility from people as well. Like we, and I, you know, I mean, we had another situation where, and I'm not going to get, I don't think that, I don't want to get into this, but there was another situation where a scout 
uh, got some information from an NHL insider, posted it, and there was consequences to that as well. We we feel like I think some people in the content creation community feel like they need to be first, and it's not about being first; it's about being right. Yeah, well, and I agree. Uh, um, and I just in terms of a sport one, I'm I'm reminded. I just want to remind everybody that this situation happened when the Bill Peters, when the Flames and Bill Pe when the Bill Peters races, uh, racism allegations came out, uh, one source reported that there was a firing and that actually did not happen mm -hmm. for a couple of days. So again, it's, that's the, that's the lesson in that, but the pile on, I'm not. Media has changed, right? It's not back in the day where we got the Calgary Herald on our doorstep when we woke up and we read it and then we watched the evening news. I mean, the reality is we're in a different era, but you're right. We, people want to be the first one to break it and their credibility sometimes is related to how quick are you to break news? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's not about always about being first. It's Kevin, we have a, someone who's posted a message in chat here. I just thought maybe you could pull that up and I have something to go along with that afterwards. Oh, sure. Let me do that. Sorry. I'm not monitoring the, I'm that's okay. Kind of, oh, I'll okay. watch it for you. I just, uh, yeah. So Lucas Gates says shocked on Johnny hockey's passing just ordered a Johnny Goudreau flames Jersey via cool hockey. The best way to pay respect. Um, yeah. Great way to play, pay respect, but I would also, I mean, I, I don't know cool hockey. I don't know if they've put out a, you know, they're going to give a percentage to the Goudreaux, but I would remind people that when Johnny Goudreau was in Calgary, uh, he was a big founder of, or he was a big supporter of the Alberta Children's Hospital Foundation, and he made personal donations there. I've reached out to the Flames to, um, to find out if uh, there's somewhere the fans can um, – can donate to, but I would say, you know, if you do want to support that support, like Kevin said, the GoFundMe, um, support the, you know, some of the charities that Johnny supported, keep that great community spirit Johnny had alive. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Because, you know, I, again, I don't know cool hockey, maybe they're supporting it, but if you're just buying a, another Jersey from fanatics with 13 on it, it really doesn't help anybody. Yeah. If yeah. you want of your collection, great. And I think that's wonderful. But if you want to help and support and maybe pay that respect, I think, you know, in the coming days, remember, this is all less than 24 hours old, like Kevin said. And I think in coming days, we will learn, you know, what we should be doing. And should we be putting tributes to the Sal Dome? Should we be, you know, donating to the Children's Hospital Foundation? Whatever that is, um, you know, let's, let's just wait a, a few minutes or a few days to get that information. Yeah. And I think that just the other thing that I would add to that part of the conversation is, is let's wait for the family to give us the go ahead to, you know, do the appropriate tributes is maybe, you know, I know that like, of course, the Columbus and Calgary play twice within a four games, games of each other, November 29th to December the 3rd in that area. Maybe the family just, you know, that's also American Thanksgiving weekend. That's also the start of the holiday season that might not be the time that the family wants maybe that family wants that private time so i think you know i think everybody is going to want all of this i think this we we really need to wait before the family gives the go ahead i think either the family or the teams like it might not be the goudreau family giving us the okay but it might be the calgary flames saying you know this is who johnny supported and is here yeah fans want to pay tribute we don't want to wait until december to pay tribute or november i mean matt saw that when he was at the cell dome today with all those people that are there i think they need yeah. to put sun out soon but i think you know i i think the flames will do something different than the blue jackets will do something different than the family will yeah i like i'm, I'm talking about like we we should raise johnny gaudreau's oh the, yeah for the ceremonial stuff of raise the 13 to the raptors yeah. kind of thing like it just that part i i think yeah that I think we should wait, but the other, of course, to paying tribute and you know, whatever way that you can, or donating to the cause or donating to whatever, of course, yeah, I agree in that sense. Yeah, um, and in, in I know that in Ohio, uh, he supported the Ohio Health Foundation mental health services and programs. Um, so you know, I would say if you're a fan, whether on this side of the border or the other side, just give it a day or two. I mean, you know, mourn, grieve but wait until the teams tell us the best way to support. And I know that hockey fans in Calgary and Columbus everywhere are going to come out in droves and support this because we want to. And I think, you know, we just need to wait for that instruction. Yeah. You know, yeah. In terms of that, um, 
you know, whether that's done through the Flames Foundation, whether we set up a, you know, a Goudreau Foundation, I don't know what that's going to look like, um, you know, but I think we'll find out in the next few days. Yeah. One thing that I just, I, you know, I, I have had three sorts of emotions going through through the day, which has been um, sadness, anger, and just shock. And one of my, just I want to point this out in terms of just the anger part, just to I, I go, I just want to, I, I need, I, I want, have to get this off my chest. In a lot of ways, just just made me a little bit more angrier that the Flames didn't beat the Oilers in 22. It just grinded my gears just a little bit more that we did not have that Johnny Gaudreau beat the Oilers moment. Because if that actually happened, there would have been a statue. We we there would have been no argument. There's a statue. Whether good, but if, if the Flames beat the Oilers, history would have been different. I don't think he would have left. I mean, yeah. you know, we'd be having a very different conversation today, right? Johnny, for better or for worse, when we look back, was not a good playoff performer. Yeah, and but you know what, I I just, but what he was was he was dedicated to his family, and he, he was. was selfless dedicated to his family dedicated to the team i mean every kid i ever saw him encounter he was you know great gracious he would give him an autograph i remember seeing him out at a community rink at minus 25 skating around with kids like you know he was the epitome of a calgary flame on and off the ice yeah he and he loved the game of hockey like he absolutely yeah he Uh, loved the game and he understood what came with it as far as being a pro in a big market like calgary and, you know, in a lot of ways, he knew how to be a pro in terms of just his behavior, his conduct. And, yes, I mean, we, I think that's the sort of the other thing with Johnny. And I think you kind of talked about it, but it's just we're reiterating this is we watched him. It, it's, it, as opposed to, like, even the Lanny era, we Lanny was grown up. The Jerome era, yeah. we he, he did grow. He grew up as a flame. It, but it was a bit different. But we didn't have the inside look into his life. The only guy that would have got more of that would have been like if they would have drafted Teach. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, we just, we saw so much of the public of Johnny and, you know, Jerome was a bit more private. I mean, and also it, it, different areas, eras, but even, you know, I mean, you look back in 04, 2004, Mika Kippersoft was out and about. And there are stories about Mika Kippersoft during, the two, his, There's a lot of stories, but we don't have pictures. We don't have documentation. Yeah. Like you know, these are all things that we would have today in the you know in the smartphone era. Yeah, yeah. Guys, I know a lot of people have talked about that game seven goal that uh, that Kevin's mentioning. Do you guys remember who it was that set up Yager for first goals of flame? It was Gaudreau, Gaudreau. number thirteen. Like you know, how many guys have even got to say that they played with Yager? Like you know, we I tend to forget Yager was a flame. Was it his best year? No, but. You know, it just it adds to who Goudreau was here. Yeah, like Yager even said of Goudreau that he's the smallest player I've ever played with. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he, yeah, I. And I, I think do. for for a whole generation of hockey fans, at least Calgary fans, I mean, we had Theo Fleury before it, but it was that whole idea of he's small and he did it and I can do it too. Yeah, the underdog. Yeah. And just the and uh, you started to see the impact that he had his he had on the game of hockey and sort of some of the players that started to get drafted. I mean, I think Cole Caulfield mentioned that. Uh, is he in the NHL without Johnny Gaudreau? Probably not. That's a guy that's a small player that I, I remember that draft year. And Matt, you probably remember that as well. But he was mm-hmm. a guy that a lot of people were shying away because of the size, right? Oh yeah, like if it wasn't for Gaudreau, like he probably would have been a third, fourth round pick just like Gaudreau was, and even though, you know, talent-wise, he was a first-round pick, and, you know, it, it had a major impact. Like, if you had the same player coming up today, like Gaudreau, when, in 2011, like, it, that's probably a top-10 pick, and even at the five foot nine, like, Clayton Keller is basically the same guy in terms of attributes, and he went seventh overall. Uh, to the Coyotes, so it, you know it's one of those things where you know he did pave the way for shorter, 
skill guys. He reminded actually... us short guys can still do this, right? Again, we had yeah. Theo and we had some other guys before that, but then we got into this era of big men and Goudreau did it. And then the Flames drafted Mangiapane and other guys like that. And I think it reminded this team that, you know, you can be short, you can be small, and you can still be a great player. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. When we look back at this, you know, as as fans that were part of the Goudreau era, if we look back at this five years from now, I don't think anyone's going to remember he's a fourth round pick. I mean, if you look at his body of work, this is a guy people, if they didn't know any better, are going to think he was a first, second round pick. Yeah. Yeah. I think in, in redrafts in his draft year, yeah, for sure. I think he's yeah, he probably goes top three. Mm. But, yeah. And, you know, we've talked a lot about the Flames and their depth at drafting. I mean, I think this is another great one. And, you know, like, good for them for taking that chance. And um, at the time, that's when Brian Burke was here. He called, he said they got a jockey at the fourth round. And, you know, it's, you know, just using terms like that, right? It was unheard of, especially for Brian Burke. When you think about truculence, Goudreau's not that guy. So good for the Flames for, you know, convincing the scouts for convincing yeah. the flames and and for the flames to take that chance well and the thing is is that the player or the person that was responsible most for the Gaudreau draft pick is actually the current general manager craig conroy yes. and you know like i i can only imagine how he's having a day today uh being the person responsible for him being at a flame in the first place and being Just remember there. the video i remember being in that game when they showed it on the jumbotron live in uh philly in that old bank vault that johnny was signed yeah yeah and you know he was the guy that went out to, to boston to sign him threw him on the jet to bring him back to vancouver and yeah. You know, uh, you know, like I, I'm sure that he's devastated just as much as anybody. Matt, I remember or, you and I talking to Johnny at his first rookie camp, and he said that part of the condition of coming is he had to finish his schooling. Yeah, mom and dad exactly. wouldn't let him sign that deal unless he finished college. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, um, yeah, I mean, I just I feel for even you know, I mean, Brad Shrelevin, I, I mean, he released a statement. Jay Feaster released a statement. Ryan Huska just posted a few minutes ago a, a tweet as well. Um, yeah, this uh, sort of the uh, yeah, I, it just. It, I mean, we talk even, I mean, you got, I feel devastated for Sean Monaghan, who oh, God, yes. signed with Columbus with the, with the intent of playing with Johnny Gaudreau. And now, well, you know, it, we're talking it, about yeah, that before the show. Like he yeah. signed for one reason. That was to reunite with his buddy. If you're the Blue Jackets, and he says, guys, I don't want to do this anymore. Do you let him walk? I think that the, the Blue Jackets would completely understand if, you know, if it's too hard. Uh, psychologically for Monaghan to be there uh, you know like uh, yeah like uh, hearing that interview that he had like he said like you know he, his kids only a couple months younger than uh, Gaudreau's and like you know the part that he was happiest about was that they were going to grow up together and you know literally two days later his best friend's dead and like it's just yeah you know what? Part of me, though, also just I would love for Shauna and you know, I, I you know, I, I Columbus has not had a lot of success in the National Hockey League, but man, it would be just fun for to just kind of cheer and say, you know what? For Johnny, we're gonna have a good year. You guys remember this hug? The hug seen yeah. around the sea of red. Yeah. Oh, that game! Like I was in the building for that one, and I, I literally, I was like, you know what? I, 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 I just for most of that, that game, I'm like, this is just not gonna happen. This is just not gonna happen. Oh, I know, Ottinger just, yeah, I doing was... his best Dominic Hasek impression, and you know, and I think there's two ways to look at this whole Monahan thing. I can see Monahan saying, "I'm staying, and I'm doing this for Johnny." And boys, you're getting on my back, and we're all doing this for Johnny. Let's go do it. And I can see him saying, you know what? I came here for Johnny, and now he's not here. This isn't the market I want to be in, and and I wouldn't fault him either way. No, I wouldn't either. But, I mean, I would love to see th – this, you know, I mean, we talked a little bit about Calgary's tragedies here. Columbus has not had it easy either. Let's not forget 
of course no uh, uh, Brittany Cecil and yeah uh, that whole thing which coincidentally was the Flames and Blue Jackets game uh, where Espen Knutson fired a puck that was deflected by Flame Derek Morris and ended up killing a 13 year old girl and yeah that's why there's netting in the NHL was that in Nashville no it was in Columbus it was in Columbus. Yeah, I remember and, that. And you know, I mean, they've um, and, they lost line A, and like you know, they yeah, they've had some off ice issues this season too, and it's got to be gutting as a as a fan. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, especially as they've been kind of circling the, you know, can't get out of the rebuild section of their existence, like yeah. uh, Buffalo and Florida have been previous. Like Florida finally actually got out of that circling the drain after like 14 years but you know uh, columbus is still stuck in there and you know there's a photo of the boys when they were on playing in boston college together and ended up winning the championship Hmm. yeah like i i know myself i will be rooting for the blue jackets this year um just because yeah, there's now a camaraderie between the Flames and the Jackets over this whole situation. You guys, and... we talked about it before we went on the air. Flames are going to wear a number 13 patch, right? Oh, guaranteed. Oh, well, yeah. I, I, I would be floored it. if they didn't. Like, it, no. If Do you think they, they've they been very proud the ice is already in? Do you think they melt the ice and put 13 under it somewhere? Yep, definitely. I, I would be shocked if they didn't. Yeah, I think I... if if he didn't pass away, I don't think Goudreau would have his number retired here. I think if he stays aflame, he would have. After this, is there any question he goes up right next to Jerome? I think so, too. Yeah. I, I don't think it'll be this year, necessarily. I think it might be too early. Yeah, it'll be at the family's uh, yeah, whenever we they're good for it. Yeah, I also think, I guess there's a couple of them. Were, now, I want to go back to Columbus in a second here, but there's a couple of other things I'd do while we're on this track. Um, I uh, I think, I wonder what the NHL, the what the Hockey Hall of Fame does with Johnny Gaudreau. Do they waive the five years and put him in posthumously to honor him, or does that happen? I wonder, I've been wondering about that. And of course, there's been a lot of talk about renaming awards, and I, I'm, I'm not the originator of this idea, but I was thinking about a little bit about it today. I could see them changing the Lady Bing to the Gaudreau Award, which he did win, so it's not out of the realm. It's he is qualified for it. I think there's a lot of the aspects that you expect from the Lady Bing Award, Johnny Gaudreau. Um encapsulates and i think i would not be surprised and i think the nhlpa votes for it i think that would be a way to honor the nhl honor of it rename the lady bing which i do believe a lot of people have found a bit to be a bit problematic as an of a name of an award to the johnny gaudreau award so well not just problematic but i mean you know there's a whole let's be honest none of these guys that the awards are named after really played even in our generation right clarence campbell um, you know, any of these, like, you know, hard. Yeah, anything. it was the original builders of the NHL. Like. Yeah, and, and and I think it's hard for modern day fans to relate to those names, you know. And, well, and like even that. the Ted Lindsay Award, which is one of the more modernly renamed awards, was a guy who played in the nineteen fifties. Yeah. Yeah. You know, who Jack Adams, nobody knows who that is. Like, you know, King Clancy. Um, Rocket Richard is probably the most well known award name, maybe yeah. the Messier one of modern fans. I think it's totally fine to say, you know what, Lady Bing has had that name and had that name for a long time. Let's modernize it for modern fans. And yeah, I'd be totally cool with the Johnny Goudreau Award. Yeah. yeah. And, and especially like th- this kind of circumstance does not really happen um, very often no. in professional sports. Like a player in his prime who's of a tier of a player like Goudreau. Like, you know, like the only guys I can think of in history are guys like Pelle Lindbergh with the Flyers. I remember that. Um, Jose Fernandez with the uh, Miami Marlins. Uh, Roberto Clemente with the Pirates in the 70s. Uh, Payne Stewart, the golfer who uh, his plane crashed in 2001. Like that, that's 
yeah. about it. Like it, it, this really like across all the sports does not really happen. And no, yeah. yeah the last two awards to be named were the Jim Gregory GM award and the EJ McGuire award of excellence. Nobody knows who those are either. Yeah. yeah. I mean, this, this is, I just want to point out the greatest player to have ever played the game officially. I mean, there will be future debate about others. Wayne Gretzky doesn't even have an award. Doesn't have an award, which is absurd to me that they have. Not I think been. though, when the great ones no longer with us, that will change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would assume that the Art Ross Trophy would be renamed the Gretzky Award or something like that, or yeah, the Hart Trophy, one or the other. Um, and I think with the new is and the other thing to remember too is the Calgary Flames have their own team awards. They have the J.R. Bud McCraig Award, the Refty Scorefield Humanitarian Award, the Sportsnet Three Star Cup. They've got the Snowy Cup that they give out at their uh, at their Dev Camp. So even if the league doesn't, I think you will see the Calgary Flames have a team award named after Johnny Goudreau. Yeah. Um, a question I have is with the new building, do we see a statue or a name of a road uh, being named after him? Well, one of my 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 ideas was is Thirteenth Street. Can we change Thirteenth Street to Goodrow Street? I think you might see that done temporarily. I don't think that'll happen forever. I think downtown right now likes the numeric streets. Um, I don't know if I would do a statue. Like I think if. I guess it depends why we're do doing a statue for him. Are we doing I, a statue because he passed away? Are we doing a statue because he's a great flame? Are we doing it for both? But I, I think it's a both situation. Like, I, I, if you're going to go that route, I would assume that you'd have one for like Lanny and again. Well, that's it. You then have to go and well. do them for everybody. And I don't know if that's in their design. I could see either having the street named after him or a part of the building, like the, you know, the Johnny Goudreau um, Plaza or something. There's four players that I think I think are worthy for a discussion, maybe five for the Flames that I, I would say are worthy for a discussion for a statue. They're Lanny, Aginla, Kippersoff, Goudreau, and Al McKinnis. I think those are the five that I think are worthy of a discussion. I think Aginla is a no-brainer. I think Lanny is a no-brainer. I don't think Al gets one until he gets un, until he's officially retired. Because Al McKinnis is still forever a flame. Oh, you're yeah, right. It, yeah, it's one of those where uh, I think because he uh, and the Flames parted ways on bad terms, and yeah. I think that would be the only reason why yeah. he wouldn't. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I would love to see, you know, the, I mean, right now the cell domes on cell dome rise. I'd love to see the, the, you know, the new building being on Johnny Gaudreau Drive or something like that. Or, again, maybe, you know, level 113 is – the Goudreau section or something like that. I think there needs to be some manifestation of this, the new building. I'm just not sure if a statue is the right way to go. Yeah. I, 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 I see what you're saying. And James. like Kevin, you were talking about that, that series against the Oilers. If the flames won, if he'd won a cup here, I think it'd be very different. Oh, for sure. For sure. And I especially beating. But what moment you capture in a, in a statue, I guess what I'm wondering, and it's going to be a game that ended up, they, you know, they, it wasn't successful. Like, I just, I don't know what moment you capture. I think one, you know, one underrated one that I think is, is, I don't know if it's a statue worthy, but I think it's, it's an underrated one game six against the Canucks in 15. Yeah where he basically took over the game. Yeah. That Again, moment. the what moment of that, like, I mean, that's the hard part for statues. What moment do you use? I mean, even just the fact of him flying down the ice, down that left side, setting everything up is, and doing that, that little button hook that he would to just stop everybody. And, you know, um, and maybe maybe this is me. Statues seem kind of old school when we look at this building. Like I don't know if statue fits with it. What if we had a a live living mural where all they were doing was playing yeah. Johnny Goudreau clips every game on a, a certain wall of the building or something? Like yeah. I think that's more of what they want out of a modern building. I, I, I actually think the Montreal Canadiens are the best at doing this, and I think more teams should follow this route. Every team should have a Hall of Fame. And you go in and you kind of remember that history. And, yeah, you can look at the Johnny Gaudreau highlights. And then you can – I mean, the mm -hmm. Jerome McGinley shift should be something that people watch. The Mika – my goodness, Mika Kippersoff saves your – like – You could have a whole 10-minute video just on that. Sure. 
yeah, yeah. like and even if not a Hall of Fame, I mean, I would love to see those things. And if you look at the new building, they have this idea of the outside being a meeting place. Like, what if those are just streaming? I don't want to say 24-7, but just played on the side of the building all day. And you can see them and watch them and appreciate them. Yeah, yeah, that'd be a What if we, one. you know how different museums, like the Glenbow has different exhibits. What if we say this month we're exhibiting Mika Kiprasov and we're showing his stuff and we're playing that and we're giving interviews and the next month is Goudreau. Like, and there's a lot of more modern ways to do that than erecting a sculpture. Yeah, I I don't disagree with you. I don't disagree with you. I I, I mean, I think that this is up for discussion and uh, in in so many ways of and how. I think hockey like a lot of sports we tend to go with the sort of the norm right the everyone else has a sculpture we need a sculpture and maybe Calgary needs to be the one to come up with something new I just I don't know when I look at that building I don't think that having you know Johnny Goudreau and bronze outside of it's going to be the best look yeah I, I've I, I think there's there's certainly a number of different ways that that can and, you know, they the other thing they could do, too, if they don't name the whole building or the, you know, the street after them, I was just thinking about this. We have a 1,000 seat building or arena being tacked onto this building. What if that 1,000 seat arena is Johnny Goudreau Arena? Yeah. Me, yeah. Right. Scotia Place with Johnny Goudreau Arena. Yeah. Yeah. I think all of that is certainly, yeah, that's certainly up for. Up for I think it's also adequate that the little arena is named after him. I think. I saw what you did there. Yes. Uh, right. I, I mean, I think that would be great is, you know, Johnny Goudreau arena at Scotia place, I think would be a fitting tribute to him. Yeah. Yeah. And just keep 13, you know, on center ice for that one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just to go back to Columbus, I just, the other one that I just want to remind people of is the, um, of course the, tragedy of Matthias uh, Klevniks. I think I've mispronounced his, but he was the one that he was who passed away that saved, essentially saved Elvis Merzlikens' life uh, back in 2021. So, I mean, three years ago, yes, for Columbus, but still a, just a, a very devastated and unfortunate situation that you're bringing mm -hmm. Back yeah, to speaking of feeling sorry for people, um, you know, I feel sorry for Elvis having to deal with, you know, losing a, a close friend who saved his life and died because of it. And then, you know, one of his good friends on the team also dies like a couple of years later. It's like, why am I cursed <laughs> level of, yeah. you know, ridiculousness? Kevin, we have a comment here from YouTube from Stephanie Ray. Um, you know, kind of interesting to think about. I, I And, you know, this isn't really a discussion for today, but I think the Calgary Flames tickets are going to be more readily available this year as the team isn't great. I don't think anyone would have looked at the Columbus game as being a sellout. I think now it is. Like, you know, yeah. as Stephanie's saying, save that date, December 3rd versus Columbus. I think it'll be hard to get a ticket to that building now where if this didn't happen – you it would have been easy to get that ticket. Nobody's coming to see the Blue Jackets play. It's a Tuesday. Much, yeah. It's a Tuesday night night game. Yeah, and I think that could now be the game to go to the seasons like last year, right? Everyone was giving, you know, everyone wanted Kippersoft retirement tickets. I think that could be the game this year that yeah. you want to be at. Yeah, yeah, I think in November 29th, That is a that's the day after Thanksgiving of the Black Friday game in Columbus, too. I think that that's going to be a very. Uh, I think you're going to see a bunch of Flames do them both, make the pilgrimage yeah. over, and then you know come back here for this game. I would be open. I, I'll just toss this out. Like I, I do think the Young Stars Classic is a great idea, but I would be open to sort of a uh, Calgary Columbus sort of annual Johnny Gaudreau, Johnny Matthew Gaudreau tribute. And I, I wonder if we see something done there with the, with the four nations cup. Like, I wonder if there's something to do with, I don't know, you know, making Johnny an honorary coach or wearing 13 on us Jersey. Like, I wonder if there's something the league could do to pay tribute during that four nations cup this year. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. I think there's going to be a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of tributes from all of, I mean, the other thing that just blew me away is, I mean, you got tributes from MLB, you got tributes from NFL, uh, you got tributes all across just to how it's amazing what a big impact that this had. And you don't, 
I mean, I think, you know, Sean, Sean, for those who don't know, Sean, one of the co-hosts, he gets on me because I didn't call the key to Kucherov a superstar. But in terms of sports, I don't, I mean, I don't think that their hockey has some of the biggest superstars in major sports is my point in that conversation. But I never really looked at Johnny Gaudreau as a superstar per se, but I never realized the impact that he had and how, you know, LeBron is tweeting, Jalen Hurts is tweeting, every, like everybody is kind of getting Yeah, Mike up. Trout. Mike Trout would tweet it. Do you guys you know, remember the, the first year that Johnny left and the Flames went to Columbus and Daryl rode them all for going over his house for a party? Yeah. I was just thinking about that. Do you guys remember that that media scrum where he said the reason we lost is they were all partying with Johnny? Yeah, I think somewhere here we're just here for a visit was the quote. quote. Yeah. And, you know, I think – I and Daryl's just sour they didn't invite him over. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Probably. And, you know, this this is – I mean, Johnny has often said that Daryl Sutter and Bob Hartley were his two best coaches. I mean, you look back on that 22-23 season – um, Johnny was in the MVP conversation. I actually thought he was the Hart Trophy winner. I think I had my no. I, well, I think I was. He was at least a nominee. I think I ended up going with McDavid that year, and I think it ended up being was it Matt who won the Hart that year? I do believe it was McDavid, but I'm not mm-hmm. sure. I'll have to look that up. Was. Um, but the yeah the the um. Yeah, anyway, it just it, – it's it, – I mean, the whole – what Daryl did that year with that entire team and just how it clicked, the Lindholm, Goudreau, Kachuk line, the only – But we all knew it was a limited time, right? I mean, we said yeah. this when they came in. Daryl can only ride you for so long. Yeah, but it well, was such yeah. a special time, it right? Was. Like, and I mean, you know, you just brought up Lindholm, right? I mean, we've seen Lindholm's career trajectory since. I mean, Johnny brought out the best in Elias Lindholm. I yeah. would argue that Lindholm brought out the best in Goodrow too. I yeah, think yeah. well, I think that whole line uh, brought I, out the best yeah. in each other. It was literally everybody boosting each other. And, mm. yeah. and I mean, Matthew, it was uh, McDavid in 23, Matthews in 22. So it was McDavid in, that was the 2023 season. McKinnon won 24, 23. It was, uh, let's go back. 2020 was dry sidle. 21 was McDavid. 22 was Matthews. That was Austin Matthews that won that year. Okay. Yeah. And so I that remember, was the year that Matthews won it. Yep. Yeah. And then McDavid won in 23. But uh, Johnny was in the conversation. Yeah. Um, For sure. Like he just, and I, you know, I don't often pat myself on the back, but I never realized the impact I I had on angering Oilers fans when I that year. And it, I, I'll remember. I this is one of my memories. Is this was a game in Anaheim? I remember this because we were just finishing a podcast, and we were watching the I was watching the Flames game, and he goes into the Gaudreau goes into the corner and kind of in behind the net, and the defenseman is standing there. Uh, standing in between him and the goalie, and Elias Lindholm is in front, and Gaudreau makes this pass. All, like, like I remember through, that one. Yep. Yeah, right through the legs to Lindholm. I'm like that he is the best passer in the National Hockey League, and I do not, I'm not standing down from that. If you, like you can tell me anyone else, but like on full flight, just pure talent, Johnny Gaudreau did some things. That not a lot of other hockey players could do on on the full flight, like just in full skating, like the way he handled the puck, the way he controlled the puck in the offensive zone, the way he passed that puck. I, you know, I'm not standing down, Jim Matheson. Johnny Gaudreau was the best passer in the NHL. And yeah. you know, it, it's weird some of the things we all remember. I mean, we all brought one today. What's one of the tributes that everyone remembers? Purple Gatorade. I mean, you guys. You guys got Gatorade. I couldn't even find Gatorade. I had to find Powerade because I was told they were all sold out of Powerade. And yeah. Skittles. I mean, this guy will f- be forever known for purple Powerade and Skittles. And, you know, I remember the quote of what's – I think it was Ryan Leslie that asked, what's with the purple Powerade? Oh, it's just a – it's a it's a treat for when we score a goal. And it became a thing. I mean, I can't tell you the color any other player drinks a Powerade, but purple Powerade became Johnny's thing or purple Gatorade. And – you know, it's just, it was amazing to see even the tributes of people 
you know, giving purple Gatorade at the dome today. Well, yeah, like a, a good third to half of the tributes were. That's why I just, couldn't find any. Yeah, I went to three yeah. stores, and they one guy told me we sold out at ten a.m. Yeah, which makes entire sense. And like, I had to actually go to a Seven Eleven to find mine. So I I went to three stores and I gave up. I had to come join you guys. So I'm like, well, power rate will work. I'll just hold it this way. <laughs> yeah, I am. Um... Also, just as a reminder here, of course, just the, the way that Monahan and Gaudreau would pour the Gaudreau, the Gatorade into each other's mouth was Kevin, uh, you know, open your mouth. I'm going to drink some Gatorade now. Matt, your turn. No thanks. Just splash it on my head. And you know, <laughs> I mean, it's like in the NFL when we see the Gatorade uh, tubs. We don't know they're actually full of Gatorade. That's just a sponsor, right? For all we know, he could have been drinking purple Kool Aid. But yeah, I mean, the the purple drink was his sort of, you know, his superpower for a while. Yeah. yeah. And I yeah. think I remember watching Hockey Night in Canada one night, and they had green Gator. I'm like, oh, the boys are done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They. They. Yeah. That would be an interesting stat, eh? Look up the purple Gatorade record with the Flames and Goudreau. And- you know what I mean? Johnny was known for eating terribly. Like, you know, we all know the Skittles stories, right? That was his favorite food. And um, I won't say who, but I remember being back in the dressing room one time and the team was going on the road and Johnny was hurt. And one of the Flames um, staff, I guess, invited him over to his house. And Johnny didn't want to go because uh, it, it, it was too healthy a meal. Or sounded too healthy. Well, I mean, there was Jim Montgomery, for, of course, current Bruins coach, who did coach Johnny Gaudreau, shared a barbecue story um, that he would have three burgers with ketchup and he wouldn't eat any vegetables. Yeah. Well, that's kind of what I mean. Yeah, the, the story that I'd kind of heard people talking backstage is, oh, well, it sounded like there was a lot of vegetables, so Johnny didn't want to go. And it's like, you know, if you if any of us ate like that, we'd be getting fat and, you know, slow. And Johnny somehow was able to live on skills yeah. and Gatorade. He's yeah. eating passing. Like, it's just hilarious. Well, like, uh, there was one I was story waiting for me to go by the from... bench and they just tossed Skittles in his mouth. Yeah, yeah. Like, I remember one story that was mentioned today and uh, somebody dragged him to a sushi restaurant and he actually went next door, got a ham sandwich and came yep. back and had the ham sandwich yep. <laughs> in the sushi place. <laughs> Yeah, I've I, I've heard a few I've heard a few stories like that, especially when they were on the road and they were going for a team dinner. And um, I forget the whole story. It was years and years ago, but I heard somewhere Johnny ordered off the kids' menu or something because he wanted like craft dinner while the guys were all eating like, you know, nice steaks. Yeah, it, it, it just felt like Johnny was a guy that if you were if you were just out and about, I mean, and Johnny would come and just sit down and would have a, he's, he's one, he's one of us. He was one of us, right? Like he just would sit and have a conversation. Yep. Like, and I can't tell you the diet of any other flame current or former. Like, you know, he no. was, it, it stood out cause it was unique and he let us know about it. Right. I mean, this could have been some of the team kind of, you know, kept away from everyone's eyes, but I think it was part of their way of normalizing him. Yeah, and like really, the only other player I know something weird about like that was Ovechkin with drinking just bottles of Coke on the, you know, instead of Gatorade. Well, I mean, we all know like the Kessel diet, but that really hasn't yeah. come out out of Calgary at all. Yeah. Well, sure. I mean, the, I mean, the, of course, there was questions about Kiprasov and his smoking habit. Yeah, but well, yeah. And that you know, in different eras, like. You know, like Montreal and the old forum used to have ashtrays in the locker, mm-hmm. like for each locker, and very, like, very different. Era, of, yeah, Ila Fleur used to be like a three pack a day smoker, so like, mm-hmm. you know. And... But that was also in the day when you know you started training for training camp a week before, right? These guys yeah. were not the high performance athletes they are today. No, yeah. no. Training yeah. camp was uh, shedding the twenty pounds that you gained Pretty over much. the summer, and so you know, I mean. I think it's great we're having this conversation. I think as Flames fans, it's great to see the outpouring of support for a guy who wasn't here. If he passed away as a Flame, I can imagine it being even more. But there's been a lot of fans, and we talked about this at the top, that have been angry with how he left, including me. Was I angry about how he left as a Flames fan? Yes. I understood why he was doing it for his family, but as a Flames fan, it hurt. And I'm glad to see all these people sort of putting that aside and celebrating the great man that he was. 
I think the well, fans... Yeah, and especially when, uh, like, he left, like, I think the writing was on the wall that, like, the current situation where the Flames are at yeah. was, was time incoming. And then when and... Matthew left a couple weeks later. Yeah. I, it just, just was, it was such a, it was such a heartbreaking time in a lot of ways. I was just like, it, just from my, for me, it was like another year we lost to the, the Oilers and then this, and then this, cause I just wanted this team to, to come back. And I wanted another run against the Oilers. Cause I just, I looked, I, I, I'll, I'll be the, I'll piss I, I might make it more of my mission to piss off some more Oiler fans this year, but I don't think that that Oiler team that the Flames played was that good. And that was a no. t- to me the my anger in that was I really felt the Flames blew it. Like I yeah. really well, think- and realistically, I think that shows by them getting absolutely destroyed by Colorado the next round. Mind yeah. you, if the Flames got to the Avalanche, I think the same result probably would have happened. Been like been we might have won a game. But yeah, yeah, like I don't think that the Flames would have beat Colorado had they got through. It's just yeah, the the Flames kind of beat themselves more than the Oilers beat they them. They did. Yeah, yeah, they they kind of. And I always look back and I think the the I think if they would have won that series in Dallas in six instead of taking it to overtime in seven, I think that that had a huge impact because. And Derek Wills talked about this a couple of times, like the emotion of having that first series in 30 years against the Oilers. I just, I felt like the Oilers were more, ended up being more prepared for it for some reason than the Flames were. Even though the Flames got an amazing start in game one and it just became chaos. Well, I think uh, it, it has a lot to do with how much effort they had to actually do to beat Ottinger in the first round yeah, that year. Yeah, they were just tired. Like, it, it, you know, like we saw that with Dallas this year. Like, Dallas should have ha- manhandled the Oilers in the third round. But having to go through Vegas and Colorado, then, you know, Edmonton, like, it, it, they just ran out of gas. And I think the Flames having to beat a guy who had, like, a 970 save percentage you know, like they threw everything they had at the, just to get through. Like they, if it wasn't for Ottinger, that game, that series was probably over in five. Yeah. But it, you know, it, it literally took till overtime in game seven to actually beat him. And you know, the fantastic Gaudreau shot, which you know, <laughs> how many times did he shoot it there and miss? But you know, it, it just, yeah, like it, it's one of those. I think like they just burnt all their energy trying to get to the second round and then didn't have anything left after that. Yeah. You know, another person I just have kind of put my thought, it's kind of a weird, just hear me out here. But another person I'm just thinking about, because it doesn't feel like he's, he's not connected in Johnny Gaudreau in any friendship sort of way, but man, the weight on Jonathan Huberdeau's shoulder now even I think is just because he was the guy that was coming in and expected to replace Johnny Gaudreau. He basically what happened was is Brad took that Johnny Gaudreau contract and gave it to Jonathan Huberto and just kind of, okay, just, oh, he went to the, whoever is writing the contract, just take out Gaudreau, put in Huberto, give him this contract, have him sign it. And it just, I just I kind of legally like, changed or, his name to Goudreau because we ran out of ink. Yeah, yeah. I just feel like there's just and Kevin. Called. I mean, I've thought about that, and I wonder if that's been maybe. And, and this probably isn't the time to discuss Huberto production, but I wonder if that's maybe why we've seen Huberto's production go down. Is that weight on his shoulder? I don't think he's going to have that weight on his shoulder anymore, though. I think right now there's no expectation on anybody. Yeah, I think no. he's, he's, he'll be, and I think that might help him produce better. Yeah. yeah, well, and having uh, guys like Kuzmenko and Sharon Govich on his team as well mm-hmm. will help. But uh, Number 13, obviously, Johnny Goudreau. I mentioned earlier, 53 is first number. Do you know who wore number 13 before him for this franchise? Ole Jokinen, Mike Camilleri, German Titov, Sean Heffy, and Martin Simard. So three of, I guess, four of, five, four of six I've heard of. But, I mean, German teed off a good flame. Mike Camilleri, Ole Jokinen, he joins good company with that number 13. Yep. 
Yeah, and I think, uh, frankly, uh, this is the last time we'll ever see 13 on a player. Yeah, I mean, even if it's not yet retired, it'll be like 14. It'll just be cycled yeah. out, right? No one's no one's going to wear it. Or 34 was not worn until it was retired, right? Like, it'll yeah. be yeah. it'll be unofficially taken out of circulation. A good example is in Vancouver. There's uh, nobody wears 28 anymore because of Luke Bordeaux, which is not retired per se, but of course that was a very, that was a devastating tragedy. Yeah. Um, and then I, Rick, I don't believe anyone wears, will wear Rick Rippin's number anymore. And then he also wore 53 good company there. He joins Derek Morris and good old buddy Robinson. I remember buddy Robinson. I thought, man, is that the blue, is that a blues player? No, it's they a played the, They played a clip from elf when he scored very few times. Yeah. Yeah, I. But no, I, I totally agree with you guys. I don't, I think thirteen will be retired. I think it might be too early to do it this year, but I think it's out of circulation until it does. Yeah, it's more or less like until his family is up for, yeah, you know, c- celebrating Goodrow's life and legacy with everybody in Calgary. And I think until they're up for it, but I also think. Um... I think they need to be up for it. I think the organization needs to be up for it. I think the fans need to be up for it too. I mean, right now we're all sad. We don't want to do this when we're sad. We want this to be a celebration. I think, you know, we need some time so we can celebrate Johnny. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. I mean, look at, and, you know, I want to give the Flames organization credit. If we look at the retirement ceremonies for Jerome and Kipper, the last two, fantastic ceremonies, right? Not a dry eye in the place. You know Goudreau's has got to top that, and that's going to take time. And, you know, I don't know if they would be ready to even do it this December. They get everything they needed to go together. You know, I, I don't even know. I mean, I, I think there's going to be a public memorial first, whether that's at a game. I think that has to be something almost free to fans. I think this year is the time to do some public memorial, and then down the road we retire the number. I, I mean, just thinking about this, you know, and I, I don't think a Tuesday, December, th- like this is just me, but a Tuesday, December 3rd doesn't feel like the day to do a uh, rafter night. This feels like a hockey night in Canada moment where mm-hmm. it's, yeah. It, yeah. It's, and I, I think, uh, cause like teams do have some negotiation on dates for the schedule that's why like the flames always play on new year's eve and i think, I think for, that they would arrange that for that kind yeah of I, I think for what this is if the flames said we're ready to do it next year and told the league early enough they could say get columbus on an important date because you want those two teams to be in the building right it's kind of weird when we retire like this year kipper's jersey got retired against pittsburgh pittsburgh has no part of his journey right it should have been in san jose yeah i think that i think that for the magnitude of this this isn't just a jersey retirement the league will will make it happen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I yeah I think it, that's kind of where I'm at. Is I think you make a Calgary Columbus hockey night in Canada moment, and then you do the the rafter the the raising of the rafters. And I mean, the other thing that just popped into my head is I mean, you if know, you really want to do a Johnny Goudreau night, you have the Flames play the Blue Jackets in the Boston College building. You can do it. It's not going to happen, but that would be. Sort of your full Goudreau night. Well, yeah. the other, I mean, just I just to back to Monahan for a second. I mean, Kevin Hayes does wear thirteen. I mean, I could see Sean Monahan donning a thirteen. I was thinking about that earlier. Yeah, I could see Monty wearing thirteen or even thirty-one. Sort of switch it around for his for his buddy. No, yeah. and I, I also think. I mean, I think it's going to be emotional for a few. I think. You know when he when the flames come to Vancouver for opening night, I think that that will have some emotion to it. I think, I think the you know there's the rivalry and the respect, right? There's the you know I yeah. think well, like especially like with uh, how Jerome and that handled the Trevor Linden retirement, mm-hmm. you know, like I think that like despite the rivalry between the two teams, there's all that you know, especially since that point, there has been a level of respect and like mutual appreciation between the two yeah. uh, franchises. So I could see them doing and something as well. Thatcher Demko was a teammate of Johnny Gaudreau, by the way. So there's that connection as well. It's just, uh, 
And I mean, this is so different. This isn't a retirement. This isn't, you know, Jerome retiring. This is losing a great player in his prime. Like, you know, I don't, we don't really have precedence for this. We can't go back and say, oh, last time this happened, they did X. I think everybody's going to be making the rule book brand new. Yeah, it is. It is new. But, you know, it's kind of the one sim- similar feelings I've been having, Dan, is the the passing of Owen Hart, which was a was yeah. a, I mean, it wasn't at was I was a tragedy. It wasn't. Matt, a drug- you're not usually on here when I am, but Kevin and I talk wrestling a little bit. Yeah, but it was stupid. Like it was a stupid thing to happen. And I mean, there was the documentaries about it. Like it was just, it was, it was dumb. And it was just, that's where I find the parallels and sort of. And one thing, I I think it's, I think it's a great parallel. I hadn't thought of that, Kevin. I think that's a great one. I could see the first time Calgary's in every building this year, there's a moment of silence or ceremony or something before that game. I mean, that's going to drag out a lot of games, but I think every team is going to want their chance to pay their respects. So either Calgary or Columbus kind of whenever one of those teams comes the first time, you'll have your ceremony. Yeah. Even if it's just a, you know, moment of silence for Johnny, like whether it's, you know, Calgary playing in Utah or Calgary playing in Boston, I think Johnny is such a, a generational player and is, played against so many guys here and in so many markets and lit up so many goalies that, you know, I think everyone's going to want their chance to pay their respect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I think we, you know, nothing's been announced, so I'm purely speculating. I think whatever is done with Johnny's remains, they will stay in New Jersey. So I'm very curious to see what happens in both Calgary and Columbus in terms of a memorial for that player. You know, he's not going to lie in state. He's not going to lie in state at center ice or anything like, you know, but they got to do something because even today we saw fans who just wanted to be there and be with other fans. Well, uh, Mike Gould, a uh, friend of both shows, uh, uh, has uh, said on uh, Calgary Puck that um, there are still hundreds of people downtown at this album yeah. right now. And I think there will be all weekend. I think the fact it's a long weekend, I think you'll see people down there all weekend. I think it would also see something going on at the uh, Labor Day Classic as well. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, I would imagine, of course, the Flames and Stampeders under same ownership. I am at, wouldn't be surprised if we see the Fla- the Stampeders warm up in 13 jerseys. Yeah, I could see that too. Yeah. Especially with that GoFundMe for Matthew, I could see like... Um, the funds going for yeah. that or and, something like that. You know, even with that, Matt, I mean, we see players every year, you know, you score a goal, we donate five dollars to whatever. I could see a lot of these guys unofficially saying, you know, every point I'm donating so much to the Goudreau family. You know, whether that's made official or not, I think there's gonna be a lot of guys playing for Johnny this year. Mm-hmm. I'm just yeah, I I I just just so many people have been hurt by this and you know, I I, I want to also, I mean, we're probably, I don't know if we're close to wrapping up, but I, I do want to bring this up. And we've talked a little Before bit. you do, Kevin, I mean, Matt, you said earlier, you know, like Guy Goudreau is a character, right? And I think mm-hmm. people who mourn this are going to want to mourn with the Goudreau family too. They're going to want Guy there. They're going to want, you know, Meredith there. They're going to want, you know, to sort of be part of something official. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, sorry, Kevin, yeah. go ahead. Um, I mean, and uh, this is on the topic of of, and I, I I'm kind of wrestling with how I'm processing what I this, and this may sound a little silly when I blurt this out, but hopefully out of this comes some thought. There's been a lot of conversation about major sport, the professional sports and sports gambling, and you know that's a subject for another day. Yeah, but I think it's damn about time that professional sports addresses drinking and driving Mm -hmm. i think that there is and i i know that there's going to be some people that say that you know what we're adults look guys i'm cracking into the skittles what's that yeah (laughs) um oh crack a skittle here as well but i I mute my mic while i'm chewing but (laughs) (laughs) nom Um, nom 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 (laughs) i just think you know people go to the games they have an alcohol. I mean, it's almost you're weird not to drink. We talk about, I mean, the, the you see people carrying beer. I think it is high time to make sure 
that people are aware of the consequences of drinking and driving. And I don't necessarily think that has anything to do with the sports gambling, but I know it's going to be weird for me. I'm just, I'm brought that up because I mean, this has been a big conversation, but I think if you, if, if, I think it's time to make sure that there's room for this conversation Mm -hmm. and advertisements about it. Like when was the last time you watched a hockey game and didn't see a beer ad? Mm -hmm. Is it going to be weird for Kokanee to advertise with the flames and the blue jackets this year? Like, could this be the year we don't see a beer ad on flames games? No, I don't think that people are going to go that far. I, but I do think, I, I think that there's going to be, I, I think there's got to be a conversation about in some way about drinking and driving. Like, and I think there will be within the NHL, but I also hate to say it, Kevin, I don't know the NHL is the league that moves the needle on that. I, I'm talking about professional sports, though. I think I think that in every like like why is there like I'll, I'll I'll just toss a question out: Is there why is there no breathalyzer test when people leave games? Like, are we assuming that everybody, like, are we assuming that everybody is walking out, and, you know, after five beer or getting in or getting into a car and driving a game? Are we not asking? Why are we not asking any questions about that? Like, why is that not? From a venue perspective, if you brought that up to me, I would say, do you know how long it's going to take me to get 20,000 people breathalyzer tested and then sort with, sort them out accordingly on the way home? There's, yeah. There has to be, but I, I, I'm not saying that, 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 like, this is, I think that we need to start having conversations of how that can be effective. Like, how can we, I don't want to say. Drink that, responsibly, like, so to speak. Yeah, like, like how do we kind of, and maybe, and, you know, I, I'm just, I guess for me, I'm, I'm, I'm not a big fan of alcohol anymore. I don't, I quit drinking now four years ago and I don't miss it and. I just, this is another situation where I see the devastation of alcohol. I know that that's not always the case, but. No, I I get what you're saying. I've not been a big drinker myself. Like I might have the odd one here and there, but uh, you know, uh, for, you know, like I don't like not being in control of my faculties. So like, you know, and the, the thought of even approaching driving under even the slightest intoxications like a non-starter i'd rather walk or take an uber or a taxi home well and especially if you're at a flames game where you know you have readily you have ready access to transit Mm -hmm. yep and you know kevin i think i think this will start the discussion maybe not in all 32 markets but i think this year i mean beasley always says you know um, I think at the end of his games, be safe, don't drink and drive, if I remember correctly, on you know, sort of on his way out. I think if they've got, you know, drinking driving ads with number 13 next to them, it's gonna make people in this market think twice. Well, I hope it, it's in every market too, right? Like- I, I think it will be, but I think that you know, because it affects this market directly, if they put a, yeah. a Boston player in the cell dome, people are gonna be like, I don't care, I don't care about that guy, but well- I think I, I think like uh, the uh, group uh, Mad uh, Mothers Against yeah. Drunk Driving, you know, like uh, they should partner with the NHL to make a, you know, a, basically like a an ad like describing the Gaudreau family and literally what devastation this incident caused by some idiot driving drunk. And, I mean, I hate to say it. You need a shock ad for this. You almost need to have yeah, an ad and like where you've this, got Goudreau's kids talking about, I don't get to see daddy tomorrow on the Jumbotron, you know? Like, it's it's sad, but that's yeah. just going to Yeah. Like, you need to be stabbed in the emotions in order to get people to wake up and realize that, you know, one stupid yeah. mistake where a guy swerves to the right instead of just being patient, you know, ends the lives of two people yeah. for no reason. And, you know, I, I think there's a lot of pieces to this. I mean, you know, I think the Flames could do more. Maybe they could buy you a train ticket if you, you know, if you self-identify as inebriated. But, and I'm not condoning it in any way, but at the same time, they are making a lot of money selling you beer. And if they've got to cut you off at two, they're going to find a way to make up that revenue. No, I, I this is a, it's, it's a complex conversation for sure, but... 
it has to disclaim. I mean, technically, it'd be fairly easy to say when you buy a beer, scan your ticket. Okay, we see you've scanned three. We're not selling you another one. Like the technicality of it is not that difficult. It's all the financial piece that come with that. And, and people are going to get around that, right? People For are sure. going to find a way to drink four or five beer. And, you know, that's not. There's always going to be an idiot that gets around any rule, right? But if we can prevent something, mm -hmm. and, you know, if we can prevent something to happen in or like raise the just raise the awareness yeah if we can have one person change their mind and not get behind the wheel when they're drunk i think that's what the league needs to do and you know and i've said for for a while i think the easiest thing the flames could do is pay for your three dollar 70 cent bus ride home or train ride home if you go to your usher and say i'm too drunk to drive okay we'll let you keep your car here we're not going to tow it or ticket it We'll give you a train ticket. Come back tomorrow. Yeah, I mean, I could see like some sort of relationship with even the you know the hockey team and and, trans, and public transit and you know well, and people pay to get in. I mean, what if you even said, hey, if you you know if you're that drunk, we'll waive your park. We'll give you your parking money back. Thank you for not driving. Mm -hmm. You know, like if you keep your truck here overnight, we'll give you your money back in the morning, as long as you took our ticket. Like, yeah, there's ways to do it. Yeah. Matt's really going hard on those skills. <laughs> Are you hungry, Matt? I'm kind of yes. I haven't eaten since lunch, so you've all seen that uh, TikTok trend girl dinner. We can call this Goudreau dinner. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I that's uh, I just and I uh, the other thing that I want to say before and just in the other thing that I there's been so many things and thank you for the people that are sticking around. Um, so many. This is not a situation, obviously that did happen in the middle of the night it was a, in a busy road but like i in, in like i went for a walk this morning and i i posted this in sort of my social media within 20 minutes i saw a cyclist without a helmet someone run in front of a moving bus of someone not single within 20 minutes it's it just feels like a lot of people are just a little bit more reckless a little bit more in a hurry to get wherever that they are going and yeah it, it just takes one small bad decision and you know you could make that decision a million times and it not it doesn't uh, go be anywhere bad decision right johnny no. didn't make the bad decision this guy did yeah and how many collisions to happen like just after midnight the roads are quiet you assume that there's nobody around, so you either A, are going to run a red light, or I'm fine enough to drink because the roads are quiet and I'll get home. And I've got, I've done this a number of times. I don't see why it won't have, I'll be fine again. And those you know, are the times of that. And I'll thing. be honest, I mean, there's been times I've been out walking at 1030 at night and it's dark and I'm at a green light and I'm walking and I have the right of way and some car comes ripping through the intersection. Like, you know, I did nothing wrong here, but, you know, I, I've honestly in this year alone, I've almost been hit three times. Yeah, I, I've, I've, I would count like five or six. And I, I think, you know, we've all got to make the right decisions, not for us and not selfishly, but, you know, I think we need to make the right decision for everyone around us too. Can I drive? Sure. Should I drive? No. And I get it. You know, we we're in an economy where we don't have a lot of money right now to go around. You know, everyone's pinching pennies. Maybe there needs to be some system that, you know what, the government will pay for your first taxi ride, you know, every month or something like that. If you need to get somewhere, I mean, how many of our parents you say that, right? If you're drunk, I will come pick you up. And now that we're adults, we don't have that. Maybe there needs to be, you know, some way to bail people out that way. Mm -hmm. Shout out to the those that are in in party conversations are the ones that are saying you're not driving. Fuck you! I'm taking your way your cheese. Shout yeah. out to those people. I'm having my purple game flavored Skittle. Yeah, <laughs> per, a purple um, game drink for you. Oh, well, like uh, one person I know, uh, like they went to New York, um, and like they were there with somebody and. Uh, uh, like went to dinner and literally were crossing the street and a cabbie pulled around the corner and hit both of them. And like, he had to get a major operation on his foot and mm. it's going to be like a year until he's a hundred percent. And it's like, he, and like, he didn't do anything wrong. And 
Yeah. And I mean, this is, again, this is a larger conversation we may not want to get into. Part of this is the structure of our city, right? Calgary, you mm -hmm. have to drive to get around. If we had a more walkable city, you might have people that are more willing to leave their car who, you know, maybe walk there instead of drive there. I think there's a lot of North America, especially, is not known for being as commuter friendly as a lot of places in Europe where there are less of these accidents. So, you, you know, mm -hmm. this is a much bigger conversation than hockey. Yeah, for sure. I just, I think it's important that we start that conversation though. I, I agree. I, I, you know, it, it would be your response for us to say, you know, I, I mean, it's, I, I, I think it's important to start that conversation. And imagine if this happened in Calgary or in Columbus, like if you were the guy living in Calgary that hit Johnny here, even if you don't go to jail, you're going to be public enemy number one. Like, yeah. yeah. It's, you will, yeah. you know, you will never be a free man again in this city. Hmm. I would be scared to go back to my house. I really would if I was. Well, there. Um, you know what? Honestly, I'm I'm fearful for this gentleman that was charged. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I mean, we got his name, we got his, you know, his picture. I mean, I'm not saying I'm going to do anything or encourage anybody to, but you know, all his info is out there. Yeah, I, I'm encouraging people. Please don't do anything. Please, no. Don't. You're not Batman. You're not a vigilante. You're not. You know, let the courts handle this. Yeah. Let's stay the same classy hockey community we are. Let's grieve. Let's mourn. Let's work together. Let's let the courts do their thing with this. Just like we're seeing with the hockey, you know, the Junior Hockey Canada and stuff. Let the law deal with this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there yeah. anything else that we, before, Danny, or you have something you want to end with, but is there anything else we should talk about? Right now, I think that's it. I think for me, it's still just emotion, right? And it's, yeah. I mean, we don't have a lot of the details. And as we've talked about, what will happen next? Where do we go? I think as fans, we just need to, we need to give the Goudreau family privacy. We need to keep them in our yeah. prayers. And frankly, any of uh, Goudreau's teammates or friends, you know, just give everybody space and let them come to social media or the media when, when they're, ready. they're feeling like they're able to. Because, you know, like this is a gut punch for everybody in the hockey community, regardless if you're close to the Goudreau's or, you know, like, it, it, you know, we, we happen to have followed him since basically we started our podcast in 2012. But, he, you know, like it, it, you know, if you don't have that level of connection or, you know, or teammate or friend, like, you know, it, it's a hard day. And I would say check in on your hockey friends, you know, just send a text or, you know, send them a message. How are you doing? How is this affecting you? I know I've seen a lot of outpouring of people online and also my friend group. I have a friend who said he broke down and cried for an hour and a half today. Like reach out to your hockey friends, make sure they're okay. You know, go hang out with them, get them hyped up for the young stars tournament coming up. Just be the, be the sea of red. We know we can be. Maybe yeah. this weekend, just go down to, you know, the Red Mile and hang out and celebrate the greatness that was Johnny Gaudreau. I I remember what Jim Houston said after the humble tragedy a few years ago, and it's just something that resonates uh, in my head. But they say that, and I just love this quote, they say that you can take, I just love this line, they say that you can say take refuge in this game. Let's see. Let's try. Yeah. The hockey community, I think, is one of the best sports communities out there. Let's keep it classy, as Ron, Ron Burgundy would tell us, and, you know, let's be there for each other. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, I think outside of that, you never know when you're, you know, when somebody's going to leave you. You never know when that son, that father, that mother, that sister might not be there. So I think this long weekend as we go into it, Hug those people that are close to you a little tighter. Remind people you love them. Don't take for, for granted the time you get with those you love. Yeah. Dan, do you want to close it out? Sure. If uh, hockey fans remember, Johnny Goudreau, when he left Calgary, wrote a article in the Players' Tribune, and it was about his decision to leave. And I reread that today. And the last paragraph of that really stood out for me, and I think it's a great way to end off today. Johnny Goudreau ended with, I hope the people of Calgary can remember me not only as a hockey player, but also as a good person with good values. Thank you for supporting me over these years and for making my family a part of yours.